happening, NCC family. We're going to ask that you stand with us. Let's worship God together. It is so good to be worshiping with you tonight. We're so glad that you're here. Go ahead and have a seat, and welcome to uh, Northwest Christian Church, whether you're worshiping with us online or you're, that you're here. We are excited to be starting a new calendar year, 2023. We are so looking forward to what God has in store, not only for 
us collectively as a family of God, but for you individually. And we trust that this is going to be an amazing year and that God's going to do amazing things. And with that, we want to let you know that there's a lot of stuff going on. We have a team that just left on Wednesday to go to Kenya. 20 people are joining David and Julie. They are actually, I believe, still on an airplane. They, they got a little bit of a late start out of Amsterdam. So they're still in the air. And they're going to be landing in Nairobi um, in just a few hours. And they're going to be there for 10 days serving. And uh, we're so excited for what God has in store for uh, the way that they can serve the people down in Kenya. And uh, also what God's going to do for the people on the team. That's a really transformational opportunity for them. Because David is not here, we have a very special guest with us tonight. So um, bringing us the word tonight is the president of Boise Bible College, Derek Voorhees. And I know that God is going to really speak to you through Derek, and that's going to be a great thing. Another thing that we are doing at the beginning of this year is we are starting this year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. You may see an insert in your program that looks similar to this, and it talks about the 21 days of prayer and fasting, but the insert is not the booklet that you need. This is at the kiosk, so please make sure that you pick it up. And that is going to begin on Monday, January 9th, and together, across the 99 corridor at all of our campuses, we're going to be seeking God as we pray and as we give something up during that three-week time. And giving something up is just our way of reminding us of our dependence upon God. And so we encourage you. There's a devotional every single day, a place to write notes. And so please pick one of these up. There's also some other things at the kiosk. So make sure you visit that. We've got information about all of our events and activities this, uh, this winter and going into spring. We, you can sign up for Alpha. There's all kinds of stuff happening. We're, again, so excited that you're worshiping with us tonight. If you are able, please stand to your feet, and let's continue to worship the Lord in song.
sing all my life. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am made. our hands in submission to you, Father. Lord, we worship and we praise you and we thank you for bringing us here to worship your name, to point towards your glory. Your name is beautiful. Your gospel is beautiful. And we thank you that we heard it and we came here today to worship your name. To worship the salvation that you've given us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to have a, sta a time of standing and greeting. And uh, they told me that I could come up with the question at the end. So my question to you is, if you could volunteer and do anything here at, P uh, at NCC, what would it be? And then once you know, tell me so I can get you doing it. All right. Hey, Happy New Year, Northwest Christian Church. 2023, hard to believe, isn't it? 
Well, today there are 20 of us from Northwest Christian Church and we're actually in Nairobi, Kenya. We're worshiping with our brothers and sisters in Christ at the Bondeni Church. We are with our global mission partners, Missions of Hope, and we partner with them in the Mathari Valley slums in Nairobi, Kenya. And so while I'm preaching at Bondeni, you're gonna be doubly blessed because you get to hear a message from Derek Voorhees. He's the president of Boise Bible College. He served as a pastor of several churches, including Singing Hills in Hillsboro, Oregon. The Tabby family is part of that, all right? And Derek then transitioned to the faculty at Boise Bible College, teaches New Testament, and then in 2017, he became president. He and his wife, Nell, of 30 years, have three grown children. So I'm really excited that Derek is here, and he's gonna be kicking off our brand new series, Soul Care. I really believe that this series will be a game changer for many of us as we begin the new year, 2023. Now, I've known Derek for a number of years now, and Derek is one of those Christian leaders who is a man after God's own heart. So again, I'm really excited for you to hear from Derek. So would you please welcome Derek Voorhees. I appreciate that message from David. He's a, a one that I look up to, one that I regard, uh, a mentor from a distance. I'm grateful for this church for many years uh, and really honored to be with you tonight. Uh, I've been assessing uh, some things in my life, some life rhythms since last year in the summer, and uh, it's been challenging. Uh, so far, I've learned a couple of lessons just in my self-assessment. Uh, the first lesson is this, uh, I can give myself permission to slow down. The second lesson I'm learning, it's just very difficult to slow down. <laughs> Largely because of the, the ecosystem that we're kind of forced to behave and to live within. I mean, we are culturally being brainwashed to go faster. That, that speed is of the essence. And, and it's explicitly in our face with certain terms, you know, like, like expedite, like express, and quick, and accelerate, and on delay, and chop, chop, and I need it yesterday. Let's go. We're just surrounded by all this language. I mean, we are up to high-speed uh, internet, Wi-Fi up and down. We want faster devices in every way, from our pockets to our, any screen we have. We want something that's going to get us there quicker. We're inundated, aren't we? Soaked. We are saturated with this faster culture. And when we encounter slow, it is torture. Isn't it? I mean, do you remember the one scene from that animated movie Zootopia when that spunky rabbit police officer in the urban city Zootopia goes into the, into the regional DMV and is serviced by the sloth? Do you remember the name of the sloth, anybody? Flash? <laughs> yeah? Here's my, here's my thought. Maybe God and Flash are cut from the same cloth. Maybe there's something there that... We can learn from God, and that's something I've been learning. God moves at a different pace than at least what I'm in a current of trying to behave within, a pace that maybe sometimes we're, we're not used to. He transcends hurry. God moves beyond the ecosystem that we live within. And what the Bible teaches about God's character with regards to slowing re actually reveals a lot about his Pace. Here's just a couple of verses from Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And they jump to the New Testament, and the apostle Peter wrote, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is slow. God is patient. God's pace actually can influence our pace if we're willing to submit and to yield to Jesus and the influence of the Holy Spirit. So here's kind of the big idea of things that I've been processing with this topic since last year, and I just want to, I want to propose it to you to see how, how you resonate with this. Here's sort of my big thought. I fill up on grace as I slow down my pace. I fill up on grace as I slow down my pace, our pace, and his grace are actually connected. There's, there's, a, there's something deep within. The depth of the grace in my life is correlated intimately to the pace of my life. And as I slow down, as I at least try to slow down, 
I've been begun to experience that God actually refills this reservoir of grace within me so that the grace will kind of overflow through me onto others. It actually starts by spending time in God's presence, his timeless presence. <laughs> God's not governed by time. God, therefore, can help us steward the very thing that he created for us to encounter his grace so that we can extend grace to others. Here's a question I'd love to propose to you. What's the most precious commodity right here, right now in your life? What's the most precious commodity? Is it the, the revenue you have, the income you have? Is it the oxygen that we breathe? I would propose that time is the most precious commodity from God. You and I have been given this privilege by God to steward something that God himself created but is not constrained by. Actually, God transcends time, but he entered into it. He penetrated into time and therefore to model something of a healthy pace for us with his grace. So how well we steward our use of time is dependent upon how slow we can go. <laughs> That's countercultural here, isn't it? It is countercultural in our nation. But remember, our pace and God's grace are connected in his inverted upside down sort of a kingdom that he's invited us into. I fill up on grace when I slow down my pace. My reservoir of grace fills as I slow down. And when I actually find my, that more time that I spend with God in his timeless presence actually allows me to attach to him more intimately and to be in sync with him more truthfully. Actually, if you look at, the, at Jesus, we are apprentices of Jesus, followers of Jesus. We're going to learn a lot from him and his pace. Borrowing some thoughts here from John Mark Comer, Jesus was never, ever in a hurry. Jesus didn't let the pace of life squeeze him into its mold. Life was full for Jesus, but not over full that he couldn't be engaged with people. And Jesus expected interruptions. In fact, most of Jesus' teachings were responses to people interrupting him. The, the woman with the flow of blood, the, the centurion with the dying servant, uh, the man lowered down through the roof. He was, he was so present to be with people in the moment, even when he was interrupted. Jesus reflected the character of God. Jesus' pace mirrored God's pace. And we reflect him when we are well rested and we are at shalom with God, at peace with God. And the byproduct of hurry is actually not good, it's exhaustion. When we are overextending ourselves with this, past, this fast paced life, saying yes to everything because we don't want to miss out on anything, it, it actually demands something's going to give. And usually what gives is our ability to be a truer reflection of Jesus and his pace in this world. Jesus was never, or Jesus was always at his best when he was at a slower pace. I, I'm not sure I'm ever at my best when I'm at a fast pace. I, I sense I'm highly tempted. I get more impatient. My anger levels off the charts. I, I make unwise decisions when we're currently in a rush. John Mark Comer in a podcast said this, love, joy, and peace are incompatible to a hurried life. But when I slow down, actually you've seen, maybe you've seen, I'm a little more apt to love. Not, I'm not quick to temper. I'm patient with my kids and my wife, my colleagues in traffic. I'm more apt to have joy. Actually, joy becomes more present in my body in the moment. When I slow down, I'm able to be a little more at peace. When I'm a little late for an appointment, I can breathe. I don't fret over something. I have this essence of shalom with God, and it's matchless. I fill up on his grace when I slow down my pace. And Jesus, he defined a different sort of a kingdom pace. And I don't know if we can keep up the pace of our day and at the same time live under Jesus' rule. Something's going to give. John Ortberg said this, I cannot live in the kingdom of God with a hurried soul. So why is it so hard? <laughs> Why is it so hard to not be pressured into the world's fast pace? Why is it so hard to align ourselves with Jesus and to slow down? 
let's kind of begin to identify the problem a little bit more. Are you easily flustered when encountered by any sort of delay? Are you sort of the person that counts the cars in front of you and moves compulsively, repeatedly to the line that seems faster and shorter? Are you that sort of a person? Palamo Cantero Gomez wrote this. Here's a long quote, but it's worthwhile. She wrote, achieving, performing better, and getting things done feels good. It rewards our brain with a hit of dopamine. But when busyness tips over into a hurry sickness, our body starts releasing the stress hormone cortisol, which can cause long-term depression. In, in a constant state of overstimulation, our minds make us also feel tired, anxious, prone to irritability, and unable to relax. And get to how she closes this quote. Time is a finite source, and unfortunately, non-renewable. <laughs> We're obsessed, aren't we, with getting things done quick. Time is short. Get it done faster. <laughs> we're, we're, we're yelled at. But, but if we compare our pace to the pace of Jesus' life, you compare your pace with the pace of Jesus, I I've seen there aren't many similarities in my life and his pace. I've got some things to work on, even though Jesus had an enormous mission to complete in, in a pretty short period of time. His discipling of those 12 was never rushed. We might believe our fast-paced lives actually have a greater return, but our hurried lifestyle can actually have some serious downsides to it as it relates to kingdom goals and living out the kingdom of, of the gospel of Jesus and being a disciple who makes disciples and soul care. So what I want to talk about for the next few moments are four hazards to a hurried life. I want us to consider what a hurried life actually costs us. And I, I'm basing these four around the acronym FAST. You'll see how these relate. These are borrowed from a, a, an article I read from Relevant Magazine uh, a while back by Frank Powell, just to give him credit. I've adapted them and rephrased them. But here's the first hazard. A hurried life fractures your relationship with God. Hurry phrase our life at the ends, and it impedes our relationship with him. Hurry rationalizes and lies that I don't have enough time to sit with God. Truth is, usually it's a mismanagement of my time or I'm undisciplined. A hurry and abiding with God do not correlate and coexist. Try not slowing down when you're in love. Just try that. Just give a quick nod to your date when you took her out on a meal to a date. Never stop uh, and, and sit and listen to your date. Uh, just watch and see how long that relationship lasts, if at all. <laughs> Fast pace and hurry. When you're in love, though, oh, it's different. When you're in love, you're never watching the clock. When you're in love, you're trying to slow the clock down. You're trying to spend as much time with your date as possible. You don't want that moment to end. And the same is true with God. When we sit with God, sit with him on a date. Turn your phone, do not disturb mode. Get lost in time with him. Analyze his face. Look into his eyes. Lean into his whisper. Dwell with him in enraptured focus on you. Patiently hang on, on every word in the splendor of those words. Like the clay on the plot, potter's wheel, still and trusting in his hands, God's spirit molds us and shapes us and contours our lives to more closely re resemble Christ, but it requires us to slow, maybe even so far as to say, stop. Intimacy with God requires stillness. Intimacy requires attentiveness and, and silence. You, you must get off of life's highway <laughs> to grow closer with God. And you know, even when crowds are pressing in on Jesus to hear him or to be healed by him, Jesus oftentimes withdrew to deserted places to pray. He removed himself from the world's highway intentionally. He spent time at the rest stops of life to pray to have solitude away from everybody and everybody's demands, and, and he gained strength to fulfill his gospel-impacting mission. In the early 1900s, an English preacher named Samuel Chadwick said, hurry is the death of prayer. And C.S. Lewis observed it this way, the very moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day, they rush at you like wild animals. <laughs> 
And the first job each morning consists simply in shoving them all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other, larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. The God of the Bible is the source of that other that Lewis was talking about. We can't hear his voice if we don't slow down long enough to listen. So this year, let's work at being with God, with a quieted, undistracted mind. I'm telling you, it takes practice and discipline and grit. But we've got to because hurry impedes our awareness to what the Holy Spirit is actually saying to us. Hurry hampers our ability to be honest with God. Hurry leads to a barrenness of the soul. Hurry's kind of like the NFL running back giving a straight arm into the face of God moving down the field of life. Frank Powell said this, unless you spend extended periods of time alone with God through prayer and solitude and Sabbath, the speed of the world will skew your understanding of God. Anxiety Unrest and discontentment will hover over your life like a dark storm cloud. Indeed, hurry deteriorates our relationship with God. Just listen to Jesus as he, as he speaks about slowing down. From John 15, abide in me and I in you. That word abide means to rest, to, to stay put. It means to remain. It means to settle. It means to tether deeply into the subterranean tissue of Jesus and that deep attachment Time with Jesus will imprint his likeness in you. Abide. Intentionally means yielding to Jesus. It means not getting ahead of him. It means slowing and abiding so we can get a better sense of who he is and, and to follow his lead. Abiding in Jesus empowers your relationships. Not just with God. This way, but with your, your relationship at home and at work. Abiding produces this abundant overflow of grace that affects other people. Abide in me and I in you. And then he continues, as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. That branch is connected. It's attached to the true vine. And it's in complete dependence for the nutrients of that vine to flow through the branch. So like, like spiritual supplements, I've got to take from my naturopath doctor every meal. There's not quick fix. It's like a long-term, it's not immediate results, but long-term benefits if I stay there and I keep remaining in that habit. I'm the vine, Jesus said. I'm the true source. You're the branches. Remember that. You're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. That person bears much fruit for apart from me. You can do nothing. So if abiding means slowing, then slowing means fruit bearing from a source outside of ourselves. We need his fuel or else we'll flame out. To remain, to settle, to abide in Christ defines you. He becomes your true voice, your true identity, not your pedigree, not your legacy, not your looks, not what others will say about you, but abiding with God deepens the roots into the soil of Jesus and it produces good fruit, God fruit. Slowing nourishes our relationship with God and gives us this capacity to love God well and to be loved well by him. I fill up on his grace when I slow down my pace. The next letter in this acronym FAST starts with an A. Our hurried hazard, our hurried life avoids your need to love others. What I mean is your increased speed of life allows us sometimes to avoid other people. It gives us this false license to not meet other people's needs. The more you increase the speed of your life, the less capacity you have to actually love others. Interesting thing I've been processing in the last few months is that hurry insulates yourself so people don't get close. I mean, some feel safe with a fast pace because it keeps them from getting caught by people. Hurry feeds his appetite, however, of loneliness and gives this impression to others, you're too busy for him. Kirk Jones said, hurry is a desensitizer, snuffing out moments of intimacy with life to the point that we get used to living day after day with little deep feeling. Abiding in Jesus means abiding in a community of Jesus' people to give love and to receive love. 
For me and my wiring, uh, I, I move through my day pretty swift, uh, but I'm learning not to be so fast. I'm learning to purpose space in my day to walk slower. Space where I can intentionally be available and interact with a student or with a staff member as I walk across the parking lot or from one building to the other on the campus. So I think there's a balance, actually, of moving quick on purpose and at the same time intentionally being slow for other people. Let's take the Apostle Paul, for example. He was a driven guy on mission. Man, did he have outcome-based initiatives? You bet. Key performance indicators, oh yeah. Goals, objectives, uh uh-huh. He accumulated 100K flying, elite status with his car rental and hotels. He spoke everywhere in the Mediterranean world. Paul, Paul was slowful and busy at the same time. Those, Those things were not at odds with Paul. Paul was able to be fully present with people, but he never seemed to be too fast or rushed for people. I think because he anticipated well how to maximize his time but he slowed to be with them. Here's what he said to the church in Thessalonica. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very selves, because you had become very dear to us. Ready to share our very selves? That sounds like something Jesus would do. Paul was fully present and focused, giving undistracted attention to those followers in Thessalonica. Have you ever been with someone in an appointment trying to be present, but they're kind of faking it really badly where they're reacting to their phone every time it buzzes or something? Have you ever been there? Man, don't waste my time. Please don't. But have you ever been with somebody who's seriously important? I have an exec in my head of a major tech company who said, I got 45 minutes, Derek, and he turned his phone over and lasered me through my eyes with full attention, undistracted, didn't look at his wrist at all for any notifications. Paul was so purposed, but he allowed space in his schedule to focus on people to be with, slowing. It actually enables us to have compassion and to be conduits of grace into the lives of other people. I fill up on grace when I'm able to slow down my pace. Grace to give you and you to give each other attention and love. Here's a third hazard of a hurried life, going with our acronym FAST, here's the S, a hurried life desensitizes you to injustices. It numbs us, it deadens. Hurry causes indifference to human injustices. When our life moves at freeway speed, you know it's kind of difficult to focus on those who are off in the ditch, in the margins. We can become desensitized and unaware of brokenness in our world and our hearts can become calloused to the things that break God's heart if we're moving too fast. Things like broken families, social inequalities, global refugee crisis, abortion of the innocent, the sex slave industry, just to name a few. Hurry can desensitize us and actually can, can harden us into empathy or to apathy, I mean, as we entertain ourselves in our fast-paced lane. Jesus' pace of life, however, allowed his heart to break with injustice and and for, for oppression. Jesus gave attention to them. Slowing gives us space to empathize with people, victims of injustice, Christians around the world that are being unjustly maligned or mistreated, people living with no hope. If our heart doesn't break for the things that break God's heart, it's time to slow our pace And consider the world outside of our self-absorbed lane that we're moving fast within. Slowing can actually open our eyes to ungodly injustices around us. Grace compels us to care with the heart of God. Here's the last hazard of a hurried life. It traps, or the acronym FAST, it traps you in a self-focused purpose. It keeps us thinking that what we do matters most. Again, Frank Powell said this, God's idea of purpose isn't about doing. God's idea about purpose is about becoming. God's purpose is to conform us into the likeness of Jesus. The world says, you do you. But Jesus is saying, hey, how about do me? The process, though, of becoming like Christ, it demands slowing. 
making space to sit and be as we go and do. Slowing frames us in his purposes. I'm not talking slowing to go binge walk, binge walk on, that, on that famous or that, 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 that intriguing uh, series on Netflix. I'm not talking about mismanaging our sleep time to play Fortnite all night. I'm ta- that's the trap. That's the lie. I'm talking about slowing intentionally to be silent. At the heart of the day, when your mind is clear and you can be overly productive, where you intentionally stop. I actually heard an interesting story of a scientist who needed time away from people to focus. He liked to fish on his dock. He had a little pond near his property. And the rule was, when he was out on the dock, do not disturb him. But the story goes that all along, he actually had no hook on his line. (laughs) He didn't even want fish to disturb him as he spent time and space away from people reflecting. Likewise, making undistracted space to slow, it changes our focus on God's purposes. Again, John Ortberg, he talked about the discipline of slowing. The discipline of slowing, he says, is cultivating patience by deliberately choosing to place ourselves in positions where we simply have to wait. And in waiting, we grow our reliance on him. Now, I, I realize how hard this might be in certain seasons of our lives. If you're nursing a newborn or you're chasing toddler, you're the taxi driver for a teenager. I, I get how challenging this can be. So just do what you can do in the season you're in. But we must bear in mind the eternal irony here is the more time we spend with God, reflecting on his desires, talking with him throughout our day and the rhythm of our path involving him, you know actually what happens? He expands our time. Have you experienced that? He actually gives us more time to execute his desires. And the more time we have to invest into him, the more time we have to steward his purposes. So maybe a few practical things to slow down your mind and your body. Take the longer line at Whole Foods, at the Home Depot, Drive the speed limit. My wife calls me a competitive driver, if you know what I mean. Maybe something practically can be challenging is set your alarm 15 minutes earlier than you're used to setting up just to create some what I call morning margin where I can be a little slower in the morning. I value my son. My son loves the pour over uh, aspect of coffee or pours the hot water over coffee he's ground. But he says this, not just that I like the flavor, Dad. I want to learn to wait for the Lord as I start my day. It slows him down. And there are some real benefits and some reasons for slowing with Jesus in light of this new series, Soul Care, where you're mentally and spiritually and emotionally whole and become more healthy. It starts with a change of pace and you truly begin to realize control and release control to God and his sovereignty. You know the benefit of slowing? It can dissipate fear. Fear of failure, fear of comparison, fear of pressure to impress other people with doing things fast and quick and productive. But with that, it, there's, there's a benefit of not feeling guilty to have seasons of little accomplishment. I'm good at times. It would help me deepen my relationship with Jesus and therefore become more eternally mindful of my family and my friends and my coworkers and my neighbors. Jesus-paced people are less in a hurry. They're never a slave of a clock. They're waiting patiently for the Lord, scheduling, intentionally scheduling time with God that allows us to conform to his purposes. Okay, we've been talking about that acronym FAST, but what if we contrast the acronym FAST to the acronym SLOW? So if hurry fractures our relationship with God, slowing strengthens our capacity to love God. If hurry allows you to avoid loving people, then slowing helps us to learn how to be with people. If hurry numbs or desensitizes us, slowing opens our eyes to confront injustices with God's righteous justice. And if hurry traps us into self-centered living, slowing helps us wait as God conforms us to his passions and his purposes. Jesus had such a great wisdom of living out both going and slowing He helps us with our pace. Jesus was busy 
doing his father's business. And yet he doesn't seem to ever have indication of, of rushing with anything or with anybody. He spent time with his father. He spent valuable, precious time with his father. And from that place of intimacy, with a slowed pace, Jesus lived a full life, a life full of truth and grace. I fill up on his grace. And I slow down my pace. How about if we breathe for just a minute in prayer? Will you bow with me? I think we all understand this topic, Lord. I, th I think anybody in this room could have given this lesson. We understand the pace that, is, that we're in. It's, it's pummeling us to keep going, and it's, it's breaking us because we just can't keep it up. And, and we struggle at times to slow Jesus. Our boss doesn't seem to let us. Even our own conscience doesn't seem to let us. So we're praying that you would help us by your spirit. Would you help us? As we yield to you, oh, Father, would you conform us and shape us and contour us into the likeness of Jesus? As we slow our pace, Holy Spirit, would you do your work within us to open our eyes to the injustices around us, to help us to love and to be with people better, and to wait as you fulfill your purposes through us? Would you bless each of us? Would you work through this church to be a culture setter, and a resetting of culture here in this part of the I-99 corridor. I'm praying that you would bless this congregation and each person to be a model of grace overflowing because of a pace that's slow with you. That people would see you in us, Jesus, is our desire. So in your name we pray. We're going to continue in worship now as we pause to reflect on what Jesus Christ has done for you and for me. As we take communion, if you didn't get a chance to pick up the elements there in the tables in the back, Thanks. but I would really encourage you this evening to, to pause to reflect. There's going to be some scripture that's up on the screen. And I would just really encourage you to really think about what Christ has done for each one of us and his offer that he provides each one of us through his death and resurrection. And as we take the bread and as we drink the juice, the reminder of his body and of his blood and his death and resurrection so that we can be whole. Let's, you may go ahead and take communion whenever you're ready. Let's worship God. Oh, 
Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. You know, I believe uh, God's words to us through Derek this morning is a, a tremendous segue into our 21 days of prayer and fasting as we discipline ourselves to quiet our hearts. And so I encourage you to pick up those booklets. They're out in the lobby and also in the kiosk in the back of the worship center. And also don't forget, we also have those itineraries for the Kenya trip so you can be praying for them. And maybe the Lord is stirring in your heart. Maybe you have business to do with your Lord and Savior. We would encourage you to come to the crosses. There are people there that would love to pray with you um, they love to just be quiet with you, um, so take advantage of that. We're so glad that you've worshipped with us. We'll see you next week.